Hey everybody, welcome to Discussing Tabletop for January 19th, 2019. Of course, joining me today are uh, Joe, and we have a special guest today. We have Alex Flagg of Crafty Games. Um, Hello. Glad to have you with us today. It's going to be exciting. Thanks for having me. So yes, this is our 100th episode. Uh, I don't think we're going to do, like, this is not like... Like, you know, most people would be like, 100 episode extravaganza. No, no, we're going to talk a bunch of cool things. We'll probably reflect a little bit in the back end of the show on our 100 episodes with me and Joe here together. But other than that, it's just going to, it's another day as usual, because that's the kind of I, guys we are. I was disappointed the party hats party arrive in time. Hey, you know, um, <laughs> look, you know, I had a party this week for a small child who was turning six. That was enough parties for me. I did me. I <laughs> Oh Fair god, enough. shoot me to six. I know, god, yeah. Anyway, so, that's what we're going to start out with, the docket. We're going to start with talking with Alex about uh, Crafty Games, Mistborn, all the stuff he does. Uh, and then the rest of the docket for today is we're going to talk about the anniversaries of both Shadowrun and Battletech. 30 for Shadowrun, 35 for Battletech. That's a lot. Uh, Changing the Lost has their second edition. There's a Borg Cube Hewer set from Star Trek RPG, which just seems... Weird and interesting. Uh, the Chloris RPG is Emissary Lost. Um, Quarrier's Quamultimate Quadition. I'm probably butchering that. <laughs> that, it, that is awesome. It's everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's out. Uh, the Star Wars RPG has Allies and Avastaries, Conan the Brigand, uh, Time Breaker by Looney Labs, and Victorian Massbind by Kind Games. There was a bunch of other ones, but I don't think me and Joe are going to be here gonna be long enough to talk about all the other, like, games that were announced this week. Like, we had a couple of weeks there with nothing, and then this week, everything was announced, so... Well, it is, you know, getting to the middle... Mid it is the middle of the month of the new year, so... I know. Oh, yeah, you've got two, you're two months out from Gamma Trade Show right now, too. Yeah, holidays so are over, doing. and they're jumping out with everything. But let's right. dive into our guest here, who's, uh... Who's only going to be joining us for our little segment here, but we're going to be working on that. So, Alex, let's start by talking about one of the big titles that uh, Crafty has, Mistborn. That's the one you guys have right now, right now. And Correct. I, you know, so why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Let's start with there. Uh, so the Mistborn adventure game, I, I presume you're talking about our RPG title. Title. I'm probably. Or, I'm totally talking multiple titles. I know, I know. Let's let's start with like the RPG, and then we'll talk okay. about. I'm showing the board game oh. here if anybody just want to know, but you can just you know. But we'll start with the RPG. All right. So a uh, really brief history of um, the Mistborn title and crafty games. Uh, we um, we got the Mistborn license in 2008 um, from Brandon Sanderson. Uh, you know who does we'll finish the Wheel of Time, and we actually announced it like a week after he got the Wheel of Time. Uh, which we had no idea that was happening, or it was sort of mentioned to us late in the negotiations. Like, holy cow! Um, and so, yeah, we we've been been on uh, Mistborn in the gaming space for uh, eleven years now. Um, and and uh, we started out with a role playing game because we were a role playing game company when we started. Mm -hmm. um, and so our first game was the Mistborn Adventure Game, um, which is a bespoke RPG, uh, a narrative RPG, something along the lines of. Uh, like Savage Worlds or Fate in terms of de density uh, in which you can play heroes running a crew in the uh, Mistborn universe. It started out with a classic era. Um, we actually started the novels uh, before Brandon had finished book three. Or we started the, the game uh, before Brandon had finished book three. And um, and then he caught up to us. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we released around the time, uh, not too long after Hero of Ages dropped. And um, I think we released actually in 2011, uh, the game dropped. And so it did very well for us. Um, and then we moved into uh, the board uh, the board game space uh, with the uh, Mistborn House War, uh, which was designed by Kevin Wilson, who did Arkham Horror, Horror Cosmic Encounter, and, you know, Doom and Descent and it's tons of stuff. So... Uh, he's an old friend of ours from the AEG days uh, before he was at Fantasy Flight. And so he designed um, a board game that's set in the classic era as well. Um, so the classic era, meaning the first three novels. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, uh, and so that's a game of negotiation in which you're playing the nobles as sort of a sidequel to the first book. Um, so, yeah, you are actually running the final empire, final wall, uh, while Kelsier and Vin are actually trying to destroy it um, and trying to come out on top for the aftermath, effectively. Um, and so, yeah, and then we've also done, you know, some custom dice uh, for gaming, and we've got some other projects that we've been tinkering with on and off um, in that space as well. Cool. Uh, yeah, that's the thing is, like, I, I'd seen, like, the, the, it was, like, Brandon Sanderson's Mistborn, and I was like, oh, that's cool, you got, like, this property and stuff. I didn't realize he was the Wheel of Time guy, or one of the Wheel of Time people. <laughs> I actually have realized... they finished off after Robert Jordan passed away. Okay. Um, and so you know, and I mean, he's he's a he's a fantastic uh, novelist. He's a great storyteller. But beyond that, I mean, I I think he's really kind of u- uniquely um, positioned for doing novels in the 21st century. Like, mm. um, you know, he he's old school. He's got a huge team of people around him, um, but he can produce two to three books a year. You know, all of a very consistent quality and all really creative about the magic systems and stuff like that. And so he just, he generates that content. And I meet, I meet a lot of people that are a bit younger than me. I'm, you know, a late Gen Xer. Um, but, you know, I let meet people that are five, ten years younger than me that are just like, <gasps> Brandon Sanderson! And he's sort of like this, you know, George R. R. Martin of the millennial generation in a lot of ways because, I mean, he's he's got great ideas and a lot of them are really kind of blew people's ears back. So, um, yeah, he, he really can just, I mean, he, he puts it out there and he, he's very, uh, I mean, he's just super creative and productive and, and stuff like that. So I think he's, um, yeah, he, so he, he's not just the wheel of time guy. He's the steel heart guy. He's the Alcatraz guy. He's, you know, he's got so many books in this big universe, you know, vision and, and stuff like that. Yeah. And he's executing and it provides which you some really material too. That's the thing too, you know. Oh you yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is good. yeah. Well, you know, well, well, when I first met him um, in 2007, uh, I mean, I literally cold wrote him an email because a friend of mine had been at work was like, "You got to make an RPG of this. You got to make an RPG of this this book I've been reading." And, you know, and I've heard that. I mean, maybe even from that guy. Before. Yeah. And and you know, and so I'm like, oh hey, yeah, yeah. Everyone's like, I got this great idea for an RPG. If you just do it. Um, and, uh, so finally he, he kept bugging me about it up over lunch and stuff like that. I was like, all right, fine. Give me the book and I'll, I'll, I'll read it. So I read, I have about 40, 50 pages and I'm like, oh man, this guy's a gamer. <laughs> like, I could tell cause he had thought through magic in a way. I mean, he was considering physics, you know, about, um, sort of the way uh, for those folks who are not super familiar with how Miss Bourne works. Uh, um, as they describe the, the universe, it is a, um, it's uh, Les Miserables with low-level superpowers in a world controlled by Sauron. It's the easiest way to explain it. So, you know... <laughs> that's, that's it, quite a way of explaining it. Well, but, but you've got this poor, wretched underclass of people, the Ska, that are being oppressed um, by this powerful god-king that controls everything and is totally terrible. And then you have um, this... But they have this ability to get these kind of very specific superpowers, um, effectively through allomancy um and they use that to kind of fight back against the man so um the um but you know when i when i looked at how he described allomancy and his sense of action and stuff like that i mean all the scenes were very i mean he had a very vivid sense of how people moved through space and how conflict happened and 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 it was he lays the table like a dungeon master does sometimes narratively but then, you know, oh, the magic considers physics. You know, like, if I use my allomancy to push against something and it's heavier than me, I push away from it. Like, he'd internally balanced his own narrative things instead of saying, oh, this one's awesome. And so, of course, the hero uses this thing, you know. And um, so I was like, I've got a real suspicion this guy's a gamer. And uh, so I wrote to him. And this is back when he was just releasing his – it would have been his third novel – but it was the second Mistborn book, so he hadn't even finished the original trilogy. And uh, he's like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, let's meet. <laughs> and he was in town. At, I'm, I'm in Portland, Oregon. He was in town, like, two days later. And so I just went out and met him. I went to his reading um, and talked to him. We hit it right off. And he, I said, well, what kind of games do you like? He's like, well, I really like the old Star Wars RPG from West End. I was like, okay. 
you know, um, and, you know, we kept the conversation going and, uh, you know, I, I sort of used all that and then we, you know, the agents got involved and all that other stuff, but it, it was super copacetic and, and we had, we hit it right off. And then in the end, he liked the game so much. He like asked, well, can I write liner notes for this about how I did certain things or whatever? When he saw the final result, and I was like, uh, yes, you can write, you can, <laughs> you can write stuff. He wrote a piece of fiction for introduction um, that kind of filled in some of the misborn background, and we put that in there, and, I mean, it's, it's been great. So they've been uh, really supportive of the game and the effort the whole time. So, yeah. well, that's, that's awesome that you got that kind of yeah. connection there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a little different now. He's got six or seven series, and he is, you know, he's like a professor at BYU, and he's doing, you know, he's doing Writing Excuses, uh, which is a podcast uh, about, you know, uh, science fiction and fantasy authors, which they do a cruise now. So, I mean, he's like a mentor to a tons of different people. And I mean, this guy's got his irons in like every fire. Uh, so, yeah, it's, you know, but by necessity, we're sort of pushed out a little bit for, but it's been really nice to be involved and he's still very supportive and his folks are super supportive of what we do. So it's been good all around. Cool. Uh, now, you know, Mistborn isn't the only thing that you guys do, because um, one of the ones I did notice, which, uh, something I hadn't even thought about for a while, is you actually did the 2.0 of Spycraft. Right. So, um, I got into gaming in 2002. Uh, game, I, I had been doing some game design in video game space. We were working on, on uh, like, working on mod teams and stuff like that, so I was the, the narrative writer for a couple of, like, Counter-Strike knockoffs, and, you know, I was doing some things because I just needed something to do outside my day job. <clears throat> so I was kind of side-hustling, not getting paid. Maybe something will go somewhere. It didn't. Um, but I always loved RPGs. I'd, you know, come up through college. I played a lot of RPGs. I'd run a lot of RPGs. I'd tinkered with my own. Um, and uh, I had one idea that stuck in my head about a crime RPG, and uh, a friend of mine, um, Will Hindmarch, who you guys might know, um, from you know, he did Vampire the Eternal Struggle or not Vampire the Eternal Struggle but Vampire the Requiem um, mm-hmm. stuff like that. yeah Will does fantastic work and he's been in the industry for twenty years now um, but he and I went to college together and uh, so I I was tinkering with a little sci-fi RPG and uh, he said you know and I said I I wanted to give away for free because I've been working on mod teams. Um, and so he's like, well, you know, why put your system out there? Why go to the trouble to put a system out there when there's D20? And I said, what's D20? Um, <laughs> little did I know. And um, so I started working on a, uh, I decided the science fiction game was throwing me a bunch of curveballs. And so I decided to, to switch to a crime role playing game. And I started, I took a look at D20 and I broke it down um, and said, like, well, what doesn't work? Um, within uh you know within a modern context um because i was looking for something more like you know a john woo film and uh, or you know grand theft auto 3 was out at the time um and uh you know i i started tinkering with it tinkering with it and you know i i sort of rebuilt t20 in a lot of ways changed up how things worked um you know figured i didn't like things like partial actions or move actions or you know some of the other stuff in the, the original 3.0 D and um and I was keeping an eye out there. I'd seen a game called Spycraft, but it looked like um, the D20 Star Wars at the time, yeah. uh, the, the first version from Woods of the Coast. And uh, I was like, oh, well, my game's far away from that. And uh, then they dropped this in the spring of 2002. They dropped this uh, uh, primer called Spycraft Lite. Um, and I looked at it. I was like, holy shit, that's exactly what I did. <laughs> like, I mean, it's... I was right in line, and they, you know, they were doing spies, but my game was right adjacent to it. Like, I, I thought about games the same way they did, and designed the uh, same way they did, and they had an established system, and it was OGL, and so um, I wrote them an email called... Um, apparently, I have no problem just contacting people I don't know about, you know, doing business relationships. Um, and... Uh, I got this this guy, and I said, hey, I'm doing this this crime game. I would like to use your system. If I did it, would you just put it up on your website for free? Because I was just looking for exposure, and I wanted to get my ideas out there. And he said, uh, okay, yeah, sure. I guess you can do something and show me what you've got. And um, 
so I tinkered with it and you know I, I spent some time I, I took the new version of Spycraft released a couple weeks later I bought the book this is the first edition I took the book and I started taking it apart and rebuilding my game around it and uh, then I went to Gen Con that year the last year at, at uh, Milwaukee and um, I came with a 120 page document all rules <laughs> like here's here's how I would do I did 15 classes um, you know I, I took your your prestige class format. I, I did some tweaks here. I did. Uh, I, oh, here's the system for. Here's all the guns I would have. You know, here's all the da 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 da. And I put it in front of them, and I met a guy, Patrick Capera, um, and and some of his design team that was all there. And Patrick Capera is now my business partner. Uh, I'll just shortcut to the end there. Um, but yeah, like I showed, dropped this book in front of him, and he looks at it and he goes, "Okay, well that's really good." And and he sends me off with the mechanics lead, and. Um, we sit in the food court and go through everything. And he comes back. It's like, yeah, Alex seems to have figured out how our game works on his own. <laughs> and, um, so, uh, I got introduced. I, I hung out with them all weekend. And it was like, Oh, this is Alex. He's, he might do some design work for us. Then it was, I get introduced to somebody else. Hey, this is Alex. He's on our design team. Then it was like, <laughs> Hey, this is Alex. He's working on our next book. You know, we didn't really have a conversation in between these things. I just got into, I got upgraded as we went. <laughs> Um, and that's how I joined Spycraft. And so my first book dropped in 2003, and I joined the design team and rounded out for about uh, two years. We were producing a book every six weeks. Um, so that's where I, I had a trial by fire. This was in the halcyon days of D20. So it's there, you know, there was so much product coming out, and so many people like you know this is when Mike Merles, uh, now who's running the D&D brand, I mean he was a freelancer, you know, just grinding stuff, an entire line out by himself for Fantasy Flight. Um, and, you know, so a lot of people kind of uh, uh, cut their teeth in this grid. And, uh... Uh-oh. Uh, did we lose him for a second? Okay, we lost for a there second. I, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, my computer went to sleep on me. Um, I need oh. to play with it more. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, yes. Uh, so, anyway... Uh, we go through this about 2004. We start Spycraft 2.0. Um, you know, we have a we have a living community stuff like that, um, and uh, we spend about a year building up Spycraft 2.0, which is another complete rebuild of D20 up. Um, it's a, ended up being a million words long. It's 500 pages. No, it was half a million words long, and it was 500 pages. So it was a thousand words a page. Wow. And it was and it's a it's a Swiss clock of a game. Um, it was a game what we built. Uh, you know, where every, thing, every single thing touches everything else. Um, and so it became this just enormous uh, exercise in game design. And for a lot of people, including you know, Mike Merles, and, and uh, I know that, for instance, it, it gave part of the reason, uh, maybe a small reason, but Ken Height was so jazzed by Spycraft 2.0, it sort of inspired him to do Knight's Black Agents eventually. Um, so the... Um, because he was just like, he was blown away. His out-of-the-box article was like the nicest thing anybody had said about our work professionally. Um, on his, Because I think he picked it for his RPG of 2005. So we got, were up for all sorts of awards and stuff like that that year. And then AEG shuttered um, all their RPG lines. Um, so they had some uh, financial troubles. And so they basically had to go back to basics extremely quickly. And so... Uh, Pat got laid off, and um, you know I was out of a freelance job, um, and so we took Spycraft 2.0 and used that to build Crafty. So we opened the company in 2006, and you know we didn't know anything about working for ourselves. Um, we didn't know anything about digital publishing because <laughs> we'd all been traditional publishing where we just turned text over and pushed it off to the uh, layout team and stuff like that. But um, so we had to kind of learn everything from the ground up like i think most people in the industry end up in this situation do the same thing it's like i don't know <laughs> we'll figure it out and so and we've been figuring it out for you know the last 12 years mm -hmm. slowly but surely <laughs> and so yeah so that was spycraft 2.0 led to fantasy craft and then eventually led to to misborn and so, now to our current average. yeah so you kind of kind of like evolution of uh hitting into rpgs that have led you to kind of to this point in time so that's actually a really yeah, interesting I, story of it too. I mean, definitely. It was. It was. It's one of those things. Like, I mean, um, I'll say you know now the company has moved to be much more focused on uh, board games, um, partially because of just practicalities. I 
small children, and um, it's much easier for me to to take on something like a board game than it is a a really super labor intensive project like an RPG. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, because we had such success with the Mistborn property, we wanted to develop something that was more accessible. So that's why we got Mistborn House War. Um, it was because we wanted to leverage that and kind of transition to where it, you know, it's still Mistborn Adventure Game is popular, but it's not popular like board games are popular, and um, and, and it's not as accessible the way board games are accessible. Um, so, uh, you know, we've we've learned a lot along the way, but I, I think as even looking at it now as somebody who spends more time on board games, you know, doing board game development, board game design, then RPG design, all that RPG design stuff is hugely useful um, when I work on board games. Um, I think because so many board games are like narrative last, you know, they, they, um, they're less concerned with, uh, you know, they're, they're concerned with mechanics, but not about like sim- any particular simulation or any sort of like hitting a, um, a particular tone or, or trying to do something that feels specific to the theme. And, you know, with an RPG, we started out like, here's the theme. We want you to do, make a class of, I mean, I've had assignments like this. We want you to make a class from the character from the pretender. <laughs> we had, we had, that was a spycraft assignment I got one time. You know, we want a class of this particular concept or these two or three concepts. Make that a mechanical construct. And um, and now when I go and I look at board games, um, I think about what am I trying to do? How's it supposed to feel? And then that reflects on how the game works. Like the mechanics, I can figure out. You know, it's just a, it's actually simpler in a lot of ways than um, uh, RPGs where you, like, you're doing a D20 game. I mean, we had, how many feats in Spycraft 2.0? I mean, three, four hundred. We had 30 or 40 classes, each with 10 to 15 class abilities. So yeah. our, we're talking hundreds and 500, 600 class abilities. Oh, and then also 40 skills, all of them with sub skill, uh, sub uh, functions of skills. So you had to constantly be juggling all these interactions and stuff, and that's, I mean, that's like a lot, like that's less complicated than, a, or that's a lot more complicated than a board game. How do all these little things? So we, oh, well, I'm going to make this skill that gives you this bonus. Well, how does that reflect on this? Which reflects on these four class abilities. Which reflects on, you know what I mean? You have this chaining of all uh, how you have cascading mechanic effects, and so I, I find that having that sort of education in board games gives, lets me create mechanics and games that feel authentic to what they're supposed to be about and at the same time um, can uh, weave themselves more um, smoothly I guess through throughout the games themselves rather than kind of being well we'll just put a theme on at the end mm-hmm. which we can all tell games that do that right yeah, yeah. No, I, I definitely could understand what you're talking about um God, if I ever have the time again, I have a game system that I wrote that sure. I still have to finish at some point. And mm-hmm. the hardest part for me so far is I've been trying to do a real, a similar to real life hitting system. Oh boy. And that is <laughs> so difficult. Right. It's, it's, you know, a, a, it's mainly looking at with guns and yeah. trying to actually make it okay, you shoot, where do you hit? You think it sounds simple, but when you start involving the dice and trying to make sense of it, God. Yeah. like you... the reverse machine gun that happened in the one game that mm-hmm. shot up someone's body. Yep. Right. Have you ever seen uh, Millennium's End before? No. Okay, so <laughs> here, here's just an example of how bonkers you go. So it's not Phoenix Command level bonkers, but it's pretty bonkers. Um, uh, Millennium Zen uh, had a to to do that hit system. Um, what you actually had was little, little transparencies that looked like the the target guy. You know the you know you shoot at a target range, mm-hmm. um, and then what it'd be is you would have a um, you would take that targeting overlay and you'd put it over a silhouette of what kind of cover the character was in. So you would have a, okay, this guy's in waist high cover. So you'd find the little cover where where your target is covered to the waist. And then you take your little overlay, you put it on the top, and then you would roll the dice, and that would determine, like, the, the number would determine where you hit your grouping, 
and your group whether your grouping hit the cover or hit the person like it's crazy <laughs> you oh, know yeah uh, yeah it was millennium's end second edition um you know so it's i i think i will say this and and this is something i learned from doing spycraft for so long which was a chunky game um i mean it is a very like i said when i call it a swiss clock it's not because i'm patting myself on the back i'm saying it was extremely intricate and um simulation at some point you everybody will tell you you should simulate this they want to but really what you are trying to simulate is not physics you're trying to simulate a feeling um and all anybody wants is to feel a certain they want to feel a certain way at the end of the game and so for us um i you know i always looked at spycraft as you want to create the john McClane effect um which is Sure, you can be wearing a T-shirt. You want to walk out at the end of the story, you know, blood trickling down your chin, you know, one vitality point left, and and having blown all your action dice, and you have won the day, right? So th- there's an explosion behind you. That was the spycraft thing. You want to feel like Bond. You want to feel at the end. And so, if people like, if 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 you know, saying like, well, you have shredded the, you know, your bicep, so now you can't can only lift your arm to 45 degrees meaning you have to lay on your back to shoot your gun. Like, you could simulate that with rules, but in the end, is that gonna, is that process getting to that gonna be fun, or is it gonna get in the way of feeling like, you know, some super covert ops badass? And if it, if it gets in the way, you should get rid of it. And, and in the end, the good news is this makes your job a lot easier, right? So, <laughs> yeah, because I think... You know, when you're making things, the important thing is to get to it. The, the ultimate goal is to get to an end result, right? And and right. that's the important thing. So even if it's not perfect, like getting to something you can play and you're happy with, and then people go, well, I want the firing system to be more, you know, detailed. Yeah, you can work on that, right? Yeah. But uh, don't kill yourself. Like get to something you feel happy with. Um. So there you go. My in- inspirational speech over. <laughs> It was a good inspirational it's speech. A, it's a well you can fall down. Yeah, you know. it's just, it was just with mine. I wanted to have the chance of being able to lose body parts. Sure, sure. So yeah. That's that's what inspired me to really want to do a, a more realistic to hit system. Like, cool. I okay. I figured out the you know, okay after taking so much damage to an area, you know, it becomes you know useless or Disabled, is completely right. gone and stuff. But it's like okay, but I don't want it. I don't want to just be like, oh well, you know, as a DM, I don't want to be sitting there going, okay, you lost your hand with that shot. Right. Yeah. Oh, like, well, how do you know I lost my hand? Why? How, how did it lose? Well, how did I all hit my hand? That way, the DM, mm-hmm. it's not just a DM's decision of, okay, you lost your arm. It's look, right. this is where it hit. The arm's gone. I think that's old school. I'm... Old school Warham, Warhammer uh, or Blue Planet um, crit system. That's what you want, because then you have a neutral number-based arbiter of what happens, right? So like, you don't. So you can say like, okay, because basic attack is I attack, I roll damage, whatever. But then if you get to crit, then you roll uh, like oh, and depending how much damage you have, you have uh, you roll to see what the crit does. And so it's like the, the table tells you you lose your hand, right? Or, or you know like Warhammer had some crazy ones like it would be based on the weapon. So, oh, if you get shot with an arrow, you can't lose a hand, but you get an arrow through your neck, like, you know, you're Steve Martin or something. You know, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can do all that. So, or you get pinned to the ground. And, I mean, they're hilarious. It, it's, it's, there's tons of narrative because um, they're, they're described in typically flor- florid, like, 80s Warhammer language. So, it's like, blood spurts out in a, you know, pink mist, and, you know, as you're stapled to the floor. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> like that's what's great about it. Like, I mean, if you want inspiration and you want to have something where people limbs are flying off, I'd say like that's a really great place to start. And and Blue Planet, um, which was from Biohazard Games, it came out in the late eight, uh, late nineties. Um, they did a Fantasy Flight did a version. Skip that one. Just do the original if you can find the original one. Um, it's another one where it has just these ridiculous, and it's all based on medicine because apparently one of the people is like a medic or something or a, a EMT. So they had very specific injuries, like oh, hey, okay, your liver's punctured. Here's how to fix your character. Um, and so it, that had a very. Uh, everybody says, oh, that system is so realistic, but the combat system complexity is not super high. 
It's just that the crits, like getting shot, getting ventilated by you know small pieces of lead, is um, is uh, <laughs> very bad for you. So yeah, um, yeah. yeah it's it, that's another one that's pretty fun where you can use you can lean on the tables instead of on a bunch of rules to getting you there, uh, which is always the danger with simulation. Um, so cool. Rant over. Yeah. No. Thank you. Um, so, what's in the future for Crafty? That's a good question now. that We've kind of talked about, you know, what, you're work- what you have now a little bit. <sighs> it's, um, you know, we've been, so the last couple of years for us, I mean, we've been, you know, we're so focused on uh, Mistborn and, and getting the Mistborn House War Kickstarter uh, done that we've been, you know, sort of like, uh, we've put a lot of things aside and we've spent a lot of that time sort of taking the windfall we have from the, from our uh, our Kickstarter to sort of invest in new projects. Um, and so I think the big thing that you'll be seeing from us in like the next year, um, we have a bunch of games that are already slated, are already designed, are mostly illustrated, um, that are most people haven't heard of. We, we had some of them, we displayed some of them at um, PAX. Um, so we have some games that are in kind of the light uh, abstract space. So we have a game called um, Abstract Academy, another one called uh, Dollars to Donuts from some really talented young designers. Um, we've been cultivating a lot of talent um, from like folks who are having the first time games published in the board game space. And so uh, we're really excited about that. We have another game called The Breeze, which we showed at PAX Unplugged, um, which is this wonderful uh, uh, little kind of light, light Euro game about building, making carpets, and you're kind of running around this market trying to pull down um, uh, get the materials to fill carpet contracts um, in the ancient city of Tabriz. Um and uh, we're also we've got the Mistborn the first Mistborn Housework expansion will be coming um, this cool. summer or fall uh, called the Siege of Luthadel. I wonder yeah it, it's based on the second novel um, that has been a real uh, challenging project I co-designed that with um, Kevin Wilson because um, we had to go we had to iterate over and over again but we're actually getting illustrations in right now. So uh, we're hoping to lock that all down uh, at the end of the month and go into press uh, sometime in the late spring. So mm-hmm. um, the, the game's looking really good. Play tests have been very positive, and so it's just getting that you know that final you know fifteen twenty percent, yeah, um, and getting it across the finish line. But it's it's good. It's going to look great. Uh, it's going to be a nice compliment, and so that'll let people um, you know play. So it'll give you something markedly different it's not one of those expansions like there's more of the same you mm-hmm. know um right. it's been uh we introduced a bunch of things to the game uh have you played mistborn house war before i have not had a chance to play mistborn house war okay uh so mistborn house war is a negotiation game you are um uh you are since you're nobles and you all have sort of limited resources you are and you're trying to solve these problems that are chugging down the board a little bit like you know say fury of dracula or something like that uh, everything moves, time inexorably moves forward. Um, and when they go off the end, bad stuff happens, so you really don't want that to happen. So you're kind of, a game of frenemies is the best way to describe it. And um, so the uh, the Siege of Luthadel uh, introduces the notion of um, sides. So uh, there, there are um, uh, there are people, you have you can decide how the siege itself turns out. So since the city is the city of Luthadel is under siege in the story, um, you are, uh, you're playing the houses that are sort of determining the fate of the city. And, um, by having sides, by solving problems, you're choosing which side you're going to solve them for. These impact how the siege will turn out. Um, but it also makes you, opens you up to certain benefits and penalties for being on that side. So like, Oh, well you can turn your coat, over and over in the course of the game, uh, you can also win allegiance. And if if the um, whichever side wins, um, the allegiance tokens become extra points. So if you're on the winning side of history, you get extra a uh, uh, bonus victory point kicker. And then we have things like the rampaging coloss army that you can kind of grab to, to collect the spoils of war, but expose you to a bunch of risk. So it's it's very much a, adds a risk reward mechanic that's sort of in, uh, integrated all the way through. Of the game, a whole new deck of problems and stuff like that. So it's all it's all thematically built around the second novel, um, and but also mechanically quite different from the base game. So um, having put it in front of a bunch of people that have played Mistborn Houseborn now, they some people are like, or well, most people are like, I would rather play 
this. You know, I, 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 I want to play the advanced version, you know, where it's because um, there's a lot more triangulation um, and there's a lot of more. You can kind of take some riskier strategies to win bigger, um, things like that. So it's it's uh, pretty cool. I actually um, really like games like that where you can do that. Like, not that not that I can like bust. Like, there's a couple of board games that I could like point out that like the base game it's fun, but as soon as you add those expansions, it's like it just puts it to a new level. That you're like, why don't we always just play with this? <laughs> right. Well, I, yeah. that's the best thing. It, I, you know, I mean, this is one thing that Kevin is really good at. If you look at the expansions to his games, I mean, you know, if Descent, for example. I mean, the basic Descent was a dungeon crawler with a you know one roll dice mechanic. Um, and you know it's it's a great game, um, but you know then you add something like Road to Legend, which adds a campaign system to the whole thing and turns it much more like an RPG. Or these other ones that add introduce a new mechanic that kind of seamlessly integrates with and or makes the game play substantially differently. So you can say, like, oh, we want to play with this expansion, um, and it adds. It doesn't just add or well, Arkham Horror. It doesn't add new monsters. It adds a new way to look at the game, and that's what really adds. Um, longevity to a game because you know there's always the ones with like you get more cards you get more tokens you know but that's that's not really what we're looking for when we expand games mm -hmm. um, so yeah I, I think that what you're going to see from us in the next you know uh, 6 to 12 months are going to be you know more Mistborn House War um, you know we've we've got another very slowly uh, uh, coming along expansion to uh, Mistborn Adventure game I'm hoping that will drop this year um, our developer is on the design team for um, Pathfinder 2, so we're sort of mm. at the mercy of that right now. Okay. Um, the uh, And then we have some new uh, board and card games that we're really excited about that are sort of in the, the abstract and uh, light to medium euro space. So Cool. Yeah. No, it's the one thing. It's like... Uh... That was another thing I I did want to say, like ask about you know you're so you're you are still like working on the RPG stuff too because as much as I do love a good board game and card game, I am definitely an RPG nerd more than anything. Right, it's deep in my soul. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, it's one of those things that I I have an abiding love for RPGs and I I love making them. You know, uh, being as a a dad <laughs> with two kids, I don't get time to play with them. That's the you know, the running meme on online about the guy who wakes up from a coma and is like, <laughs> oh, you're awake. He's like, yeah, this is when we, we're going to, we schedule our RPD. You've been in a coma for 18 years. Yeah. You know, that's how it feels right now. So yeah, we're going to continue on with the Mistborn, um, a Mistborn adventure game. We have more to say about that space. It just, it's slow. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully I didn't blink out too long there. Um, not long And Okay, great. And, uh, you know, we have some other things we'd like to do with, uh, with Spycraft, but I do not have a schedule on that. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that, there is, you know, Spycraft was the, the project that brought us, you know, made us a company. And it's what brought the whole team together. And, you know, Patrick and I still really love that uh, property and we, we have things we want to do with it, you know. Um, but it's squeezing it in, in amongst everything else. So... That is not on a timeline at all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, would you um, consider getting into another RPG series down the road some point in time? It depends. I mean, you know, it's like RPGs are a tremendous amount of work. Yeah. And yeah. Um, the challenge with RPGs is the amount of work to the amount of time that they take to consume is really, really high. Um, so, especially with licensed things. Um, if I were making something whole cloth, it's different. You know, we were able to grind out, uh, even in, back in the early days of, of Spycraft, you know, we were doing a book every six weeks and people still complained they weren't, didn't have enough content. You know, and, and it's even worse with adventures. Um, you know, a lot of folks don't wanna, they wanna have a good, solid adventure and Pathfinder has spoiled us all for the amount of content you get. Um, but, yeah. you know, adventures take... A good adventure takes a long time to put together, especially if it's not a dungeon crawl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, um, you know, there aren't... In, in modern day, there are not layers full of minions just sitting around waiting to be attacked. 
by <laughs> by uh, a bunch of spies. And that's not a spy theme, right? So if I'm going to write an adventure uh, for a spy game, for example, I mean, I need to have investigation. It's, I have to have social scenes. I have to have a branching, a twi- preferably twisting narrative. Um, I have to have world hopping. Yeah, there, there's sort of a formula, but all those things are massively complicated because when I'm talking about Morocco, I can't just say, put a name and I'm going to call this place Morocco and it's full of green skinned, you know, deer people. Like <laughs> I have to be, I have to be true to what Morocco is, right? I can't, yes. I have to have real places. I have to have, it has to feel like a real time. It, ha- you know, and, and these are, these all take research and then people play the adventures like, oh, I skipped the whole Morocco scene. I can't get by without it. Uh, I have to do a bunch of work to get there. And then somebody like, yeah, you know, or that lasted us two sessions. When's the next thing coming? And I think that is a, you know, crafty is a two man company where we have, you know, a marketing guy and, and a bunch of other stuff that we have, you know, outside, we have an excellent partnership with Gamerati, but the, um, you know, we, we are just two dudes and there's only so much we can do. Um, when it comes to text. So that that's why we tend to, you know, gang tackle and try to focus and finish things. Um, but you know, there's, uh, RPGs can be a real salt mine. Um, and then people are like, I read the book overnight. When's the next one coming? I'm like, that one took me six months to write. <laughs> you know, I, they, they, we cannot produce them at the, at the rate some people want them. So, yeah. um, when it comes to new series, I would have to have a really good reason why. And I, I think for me, uh, you know, I've drafted a Spycraft third edition system that I'm very happy with. And I've got the system I developed for Mistborn, uh, adventure game, which I'm also very happy with. I think it's got a lot of flexibility we haven't really used anywhere else. Um, but there's, I have other games uh, that I can do with it already popped up in my mind. But building a, and building an RPG system from scratch, I don't think I'm going to do that again. Like, I have these other ones that I can finish uh, and I can do... but. I would be pretty happy with either one of those. And there's a lot of great licensed games out there too. Like doing something like Fate or Protocol or you know, whatever systems that are available, you know, it could use those. But yeah. um so yeah, if are you are you leaning into me doing a Cosmere game or a Stormlight game? Cuz that's the question I get asked about a lot. Um, um probably not. <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> one of those things. Is, um I was just curious pretty much, you know, sure. like if you would want to do something else in the future. And the fact is like I would definitely agree with you about, you know, like, I using another system <laughs> instead of, like, writing your own. That's yeah. just, like, I've, I've tried to write an RPG system years ago, and I was, it was, uh, mm. <laughs> Well, you have to plan for all these contingencies that may never come up, and exactly. you have to write rules for them. I mean, yeah. and, and there's, there is no greater example of that in my resume, certainly, than Spycraft people. Mm-hmm. We have contingencies for everything. And yeah. a lot of people are like, why is this in here? It's like, well, it might come up. <laughs> uh, we told you we give you rules for all the things you'd need, so yeah, we planned ahead, we laid everything out, and uh, you know, and then there's the times where we decided, well, we don't need to lay out what a trial looks like as a dramatic conflict, and then someone's like, but where is that? What's wrong with you? You know, and so I, we, it, it's, it, the um, it's so hard to predict. And, yeah. and to simulate every single thing in someone's life, and then other people are like, "Well, you're simulating everything. I just want to hand wave it all. Then go ahead and do it." So I, I um, and, and that's the that's always the push pull. You know, you can invest, you can sink so much time into RPG design for things that no one cares about, and um, and that don't make the game more fun, just make it more complete. Um, and completeness is not necessarily fun. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the. Um, uh, that that's the juggle. The, the it's always the juggle. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I might consider an RPG system if it was sufficiently enticing, and I could use something I have or somebody had already made. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it's it's like Stormlight or something like that. I, I don't suspect we'll do because those are the Mistborn series is really hard. Like it's, um, and it's not for the reasons people expect. You know, it's it's not because of working with anyone. At Dragon Steel, it's not because of the novels like it's hard to figure out how to model magic. I, you know, we figured that out. Um, the hard thing is all the stuff you don't know. Mm-hmm. Like, having an example of, we had a debate one time that took us a couple weeks with the canon um, experts over there at 
about whether there are birds in the universe. Birds. And the, the answer we ultimately came up with is Vin at one point describes herself as flying like a bird. So we're like, if she knows that what a bird is, <laughs> then there's a bird. <laughs> you know, but question is, what color, are there green plants? We've had that question, that debate. Because in a novel, um, like a good RPG, <laughs> you simulate only what you need. And everything else, you just, whatever. You don't worry about what people eat exactly. You don't worry about what, uh, you know, what fabric is a woman's bustle made of, right? But in you're writing an RPG, people expect you to have that level of texture and detail. Oh, and then that's the type of stuff we have to fill in. And that's, so we, we constantly are writing and like, does that actually, do we actually know if that's true or not? Uh, do we know yeah. if, if this can be good? Yeah, and, and our authors, you know, they don't know that. Yeah, and so we have to run it and then edit it. And oh my gosh, we've got this whole thing. And so that's the challenge of licenses. And sometimes you just run these little little bombs that are all over the place. Um, and you know you're trying to fit into canon. You're trying to expand canon in the process. And that's it, it's uh, so it's just a constant minefield you're walking through sometimes. Um, and that's uh, yeah, that's the joy of doing RPGs. Is it's a lot of work sometimes for things that are not gonna. Uh, necessarily uh pan out for you or or you know or people be like eh. <laughs> well great um, at least i enjoy doing it i guess that's that's where you have to hope yeah uh, it's like you hope that the work you're doing not only are you going to enjoy it but then the, that somewhere someone is going to enjoy it yeah and that is the nice thing uh i will say with with working with Mistborn is the, the Mistborn um space Aside from the novels, is pretty small, and so almost every year at Gen Con or something like that, we'll have somebody walking down the aisle, and then I'll hear a "What?" <laughs> and then someone looks and points. They make Mistborn games. You know, I had one person cry when she saw it. She was so "There's a Mistborn RPG." You know, she covered her mouth and she got so. And I was like, "Yep, yeah. yes, we've been making it for ten years. <laughs> Would you like to see it?" Yeah, I'll tell you about it, you know, and it's, that is actually, I find it, uh, not only kind of endearing, but really, uh, one thing I really love about the Mistborn fandom, um, is that they're like so enthusiastic, so thirsty for more of the, these books they love so much. And so they really go in with both feet and they're really, uh, you know, uh, not just uncritically accepting of things. They, they, they love what they see. And then when they really love it, they let you know. So like it's a very engaged fan base, which I really like, and um, and one who really just loves what they uh, like, loves having more, and really appreciates having the 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 effort we put into trying to uh, create a space in which they can create their own stories in in Brandon's universe. Um, they seem to really appreciate that. So cool, I like that a lot. Cool. Um, mm-hmm. All right. I think it's the majority. I think we actually covered the majority of topics with all those stories I was going to kind of ask you about too. Okay. Definitely. Well, yeah, I'm known to run at my uh, run at my mouth a lot. No, so. it was some great stuff too because it kind of get you got into like some like the the history of your company and stuff and like the the RPG history too because that's something that's actually so interesting. Like people mm-hmm. talk about like the old AD and D days, but there was a lot of stuff going on in the early two thousands that is very important for talking about RPGs that we all have to remember. Oh yeah. About. Oh I mean it was uh, in my opinion the early two thousands was the uh, it was the second coming of the early eighties. It, it's kinda of, if you look at the the history of RPGs, it's like every ten years there's sort of a big surge, at least historically. So you, you the, the the early eighties is where the D and D clones started coming. Um, the early '90s is when uh, World of Darkness blew up. It's where you, the, uh, for lack of a better day, uh, uh, term, it's sort of the the Iron Age of um, of RPGs. So you have all the World of Darkness, uh, you know, Vampire Mage, uh, all these games come out. Cyberpunk 2020, you know, I, that was you know, I mean, Cyberpunk 2020 Second Edition. That's really where it sort of caught fire. A bunch of other games hit in that period of time and it was wonderful innovation away from Dungeons and Dragons at that point um, and then you had the rena- the the second renaissance of D&D in early 2000s and I don't know I maybe maybe my I'm positing wrong I, I wouldn't would you say the early 15s were a good time for RPGs or I, think, I mean that's Pathfinder 
I think Pathfinder and D and D Fifth Edition have definitely driven like a new thing because I think like mm. oh in, you know what story games it was story games that yeah. time Fate yeah Fate you stuff know, you, too you look at that like mm-hmm. late you, well, well I mean it started in the mid two thousands right post yeah. Forge stuff you have all the um, you have like Dogs in the Vineyard Apocalypse World but you, around 2011, 2012, Apocalypse World, uh, One Roll Engine, um, and all the, the subsequent games like that, like Godlike and whatever, all those things start dropping. And so but you again, you see sort of innovation away from the... It's, it's always like a... It's a pendulum swing between D&D and then not D&D, D&D and then not D&D. And Pathfinder, of course, dominates and sort of eliminates all the third-party um, D&D stuff that had been happening. The, the, the D&D renaissance is sort of over at that point, right? Because fourth, it's fourth edition in yeah. the early days. And so there's that negative re, uh, negative push against it. Um, and uh, and so Pathfinder comes in and sucks all the volume out by saying, we'll just give you 3.5, 3.75, you know, and, um, right. and sort of sucks up, vacuums up all that attention in one company um, quite wisely. But you have like Shadowrun fourth edition, or fifth edition drops around that time, so it, it, there's a bunch of stuff that comes up. So I mean, but now we're seeing it. I mean, D and D fifth is really, you know, I I don't know anybody that said bad things about it. Really, um, you know, some folks want more depth, but they can go play Pathfinder. The most of them just end up going off and play Pathfinder. <laughs> so, and I'll be real interested to see how uh, Pathfinder um, two does. I mean, I what they're doing makes a lot of sense. I mean, knowing Logan. And what I've heard from him, it sounds like they're making a lot of really sound mechanical choices. Um, so, and eventually, I mean, the stuff we've done for, well, that I've got drafted up for Spycraft 3rd Edition is pretty different from where we were originally. Still got the D20 guts, but um, I feel like it's going to be, it'll be a, another game that would be very interesting, I think, to a lot of people that are sort of... Uh, it would be interesting to folks who want something that's a little bit more accessible, but also folks that uh, um, liked D- uh, Spycraft for a reason, mechanically. Mm-hmm. Um, I, the, the, I'll give you my great my, my lasting analogy, which is, you know, I, I talked about the Swiss clock 2.0. Um, and I, I really sort of based, well, we've sort of based the notion of Spycraft 3rd edition on a different um, machine uh, that works very well, which is the AK-47. Um, the, <laughs> the the reason being, we wanted a system where you could pour dirt through it, you could take it apart, you could strip parts off of it, and it still work. You know what I mean? So yeah. uh, the, the, the the design principle there is very different from Spycraft 2.0, where we wanted this intricate intricate system of uh, intricate lattice of connecting systems. Uh, here we want systems that all work together, but are self-contained. So that if you choose to just take something and throw it away, there will be a core, of course. You know, mm-hmm. skills and, 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 and classes and all that other stuff are still in there. And the D20, of course, is still in there. But outside those core things, um, most things can be added or pulled off. They're, they're, they're not, I guess, modulars, maybe not the term I would use, but it's, it, they are things that can be removed and will not break the game. And we found that with Spycraft 2.0, that people felt... Uh, had a hard time hacking it at the table. You know, I think that's the thing is now people want to customize their games. And Spycraft 2.0, it's like if you were to open a watch and take out a cog, do you feel confident that watch will work anymore? Mm. It might. You know, maybe the second handle will stop. No big deal. But it may cause the whole thing to grind to a halt. And so I think that that's, that was the problem with the Swiss clock design choice was that it it everyone felt very uh, that it had to be treated very delicately and had to be used in its own. Um, and so I think that, you know, going to systems where, and I, I see this with Pathfinder 2, uh, and definitely with D&D 5th, um, there's a, the core of, of the games are pretty sleek, and then it's all the stuff you add on can be sort of customized however you want it to go in. And I, I, I think that's the future of at least mainstream, mainstream game design. Um, you know, story games are all customized to what they're doing. Uh, so, largely, they, they're already doing. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, uh, thank you for joining us, Alex. It's been a great talk. Sure. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We definitely was good to dive into all this different stuff here. 
Um, okay. <laughs> we went definitely longer than I think we either of us were planning. But that's oh, fine. Oh, yeah, no. Hey. It was Once a great I get concept. talking. Yeah, and it was a great conversation. Cool. Okay, All right. great. Well, I'll let you guys get back to uh, what you got to get done. Yeah, we'll get the rest of it and stuff. So thank you for joining us. Is there any uh, like uh, specific links or places to check you out and stuff like that? Sure, yeah. The best place to check us out is uh, www.crafty-games.com. So crafty-games.com is our main website. You can see all our misinformed products there. Um, and uh, the other place to uh, – we also have a, a sign up for our newsletter. We're going to have a newsletter going out, and that's the kind of best place to keep up with our news and whatever. Just sign up for that. Uh, you can get to it from the front page. Um, we also have a Facebook group that's fairly active. We have forums. Uh, if you have questions about our games, we have a great community there that's always happy to jump in and answer, especially about the RPGs. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Okay, cool. Great. Well, thank you for joining us. It was a good one. Thanks. You Bye. take care. Yep, you too. Bye. Yep, take Bye. care. All right, now I think we can successfully switch over. No, I'll just adjust it on the fly here in a second. <laughs> because reasons. Anyway, so why don't we move on, though, as I'm adjusting this, because uh, we had quite a conversation there, but we do want to get some other topics in here before we finish up today. Let's talk about um, Shadowrun and um, Battletech's anniversaries, because the two of those are uh, having anniversaries. Happy so, anniversary. Yes. Well, uh, Shadowrun's having its 30th anniversary, which, I mean, that's that's kind of impressive. I didn't I didn't realize it was 89 that it started in. I, you, when I think about it, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, it was the 80s. But I always, I always thought it was like... I thought it was earlier than that, actually. Yes, I did <laughs> too, actually. It's one of those tricky things about it. Um, that I thought it was earlier also. And then uh, Battletech, which is a system that I, I did a little bit of, but not a huge amount of. That's 35 years. That was 84. And I think it's more known for its miniatures game rather than its RPG side. You know, because that was the big mech... Me it's Mech Warrior. It's the big, like, mech yeah. miniatures slash RPG game. But, you know, you always think of it more as that uh, miniatures game more than the RPG. But I had more experience with the RPG so I had not experienced it at all so. <laughs> I'm just glad to see that uh, like Catalyst is doing something actually very nice to celebrate these things because they're like the anniversaries are this year and they're kind of be put out a bunch of stuff to celebrate it like new books and like for both Shadowrun and um, Mech Warrior, they have like licensed products they have like a a uh, logo for 30, 30th anniversary of Shadowrun that they got it, and a logo for the 35th of Battletech that you can get, like, on shirts and stuff, which is kind of cool if you really want to celebrate them. Yeah. And they're putting a bunch of products for it, so that's something that's just kind of neat. Very uh, cool. Oh, yeah, and, and happy anniversary, uh, Shadowrun and Battletech. Both of you are... are I, Shadowrun, again, is the system I like more, and I'm... It's kind of like this weird thing to say, like, wow, I'm 30 years old now. Oh, Jesus. It's only a few years younger than us. Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> Bo both of them are... Man, now, now I think back, it's like, yeah, both of them are younger than us. Back in our day. Jesus. Used to play rock I was too young, <laughs> by far, to play Battletech no, when it came saying, out. We used to play rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. No, that... that that is definitely a uh, rock paper scissors. <laughs> you are a silly man, I have to say. Rock paper scissors, lizard Spock. Did you say lizard Spock? Lizard. I said rock paper lizard scissors Spock. Oh, <laughs> not lizard Spock. <laughs> oh no, Spock is combined with a lizard. <laughs> it's a transporter accident. Is this like two Vix? From Voyager? Yeah. It's, 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 not, it's not another crew member. It's just a lizard. That, that's kind of sad. <laughs> it's like, can, should we undo this? It's like, it doesn't be illogical. I am fine as a lizard. As it like licks his eyeball or something? Because oh, lizard God. sucks. 
I mean, would, would Lizard Spock get rid of the lizard? Probably. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> This is illogical for me. This to is be... this is a very weird conversation to have after that interview. Spock. Yeah. Oh God. Um, but no. I kind of just wanted to hit on the fact that Catalyst is doing the celebration of it. They're throwing out a bunch of stuff. You can check it out. It's a lot of cool like books and stuff. And yeah, congratulations on both of them for being successful product lines. I guess is a great way of saying it. Games that still go now, you know. Yeah. Good for them. They still kept going. But let's uh, let's let's just try to charge through a little bit here on things. Because we got a lot to cover. We got a bunch to cover, and it, it's, it was a wonderful conversation. But we did go a lot. Uh, so, Change of the Lost Second Edition is out. Uh, this is something I just wanted to hint because I know. Uh, our good uh, friend Worm, who can't really co-host as much, if any, mu anymore, if if he can at all, uh, right. was a big changeling person, especially this version of it, because it's the uh, second edition. It's the second edition, but it's the not. It's not. Uh, is it? Um, it's not off the revamped world. Yeah, it's not off the revamped world. Yeah, it's it's, it's off the original. It's off the original, and so that's a little different than what it is, but. I, I'm wondering if it's the second edition of what they did. Because I'm curious as to what they mean by changing the lost second edition. Um, Ooh, excuse me. That too. Because <laughs> um, it's Onyx Path stuff, and, you know, they have done a lot of things. So I'm just curious as to where it links up to. Because is this. I th thought they would have done like a changeling uh, 20th anniversary or you know right I think they did do one sort of but I don't know uh, yeah because it's the Chronicles of Darkness has their own thing for it and this is just Unless this is the, is, is the 20th edition, which is technically the second edition because they haven't had another edition, which actually might be true. Because Vampire had a bunch of them, and Mage had a bunch, and Werewolf had a bunch, but did Changeling? I'm not sure. That's another thing, yeah. I don't... I don't know if they actually have had uh, more stuff other than this one. You know... Right. Ah. Yeah, because it's Changeling the Dreaming and Changeling the Lost, and Changeling the Lost was the uh, other one. And, um... Yeah, I think Dreaming is set in the other one. God! You know... <laughs> Actually, no, Lost might be the um, Chronicles of Darkness. Yeah, Change of the Lost is Chronicles of Darkness. So it is the Chronicles of Darkness one, actually. You, that is that is what it is. So the second edition, this is the one that Worm would like to do. Change of the Lost. Because he was doing the, sec the Chronicles of Darkness version of Changeling that he had the game for. And I'm trying to... The monikers confuse the crap out of me sometimes. I'm sorry. You know, I... I just, mm, brain. And they've been working on this since 2014, apparently, they announced it. And it's just coming out now, which is kind of cool. So, this is finally them diving back into um, some more Chronicles. But they've been doing Chronicles of Darkness, too, anyway. So, But, um, yeah, if you're a big fan of Changeling, uh, and you're the Chronicles Darkness version of it, then this is it. Which, the thing is, I, I always thought that the two versions of Changeling had very interesting ways of going about it. Because, like, one was your humans that are locking fey powers almost, you know, that are, like, have a fey ancestry you didn't know about. Which is the Changeling the Dreaming. Changeling mm -hmm. the Lost was more that you're from the fairy realm and almost going into the mortal realm and becoming mortal. So it's the reverse, which is also very interesting. And both stories actually have very interesting ways of, like, going about it. I think that's the one point that I always thought that 
the Chronicles of Darkness and the original World of Darkness, both versions of Changeling, had a place, almost, you know, because they are different directions, so definitely very different for your characters. Right. Anyway. So, it's out now. Um, I know we're, like, hitting into these pretty quickly. Quickly. <laughs> but the problem is timing. Yeah, 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 it's fine. Uh, and if we get into one a little deeper, we'll get into one a little deeper. Um, I'm not going to throw up any image unless we start going into... Hey, Star Trek Adventures has the Borg Cube box set. That looks cool. <laughs> Yes, it does. It looks cute. It's like it's like and you do get a bunch of stuff with it. I know. It's it's like their starter set is a Borg cube almost. I don't know if it's actually their starter set, but it's like a. <laughs> it's, it does come with the core edition of the book is the thing too. So I'm not sure how it all fits together. I'm I'm curious as to it. Because then it's got three dice sets, uh, the Threat Monument token, a poster math, a reference card, the Game Master's screen with a Borg Hall outer design, uh, a tray for their range of collectible minis, um, the entire Star Trek Adventures PDF collection apparently comes with it too. Mm -hmm. So you get a physical book and the PDF collection. They're in pre-order now. But the thing is, it is 258 Dollars. I'm sorry, two hundred fifty-seven ninety-nine cents. It is expensive for all of this, but it's like a collector's edition. So that's the kind of thing I'm like, and it's nine PDFs are also in it too, that you're getting with this. So it's like it's hard to calculate if it's a deal or not because you're getting so much stuff plus oh, yeah. a gigantic Borg cube. <laughs> That's 30 centimeters across, they say? That's a pretty decent size. Damn. It's like... Meh. Cube. Here, I actually will probably show this one to yeah, folks. Yeah, it's actually cool enough that... I will try to, like, get this image up on stream so people can see the board cube here. Um... I never thought about it, but... Is it good for RPGs to get into kind of more collector's editions things? Like, I know Dungeons and Dragons have had like legacy editions of like third edition books and stuff like that, which were more collector's editions, like the leather bound ones. And that's a fine thing in and of itself. But this reminds me a lot of like those video game collector's editions and box sets a little bit, you know? Right. Granted, I think it seems like there's less stuff in here that would be specifically to, you know, not related to the RPG. Like those things, the video game box sets will oftentimes put like little figures or art books or all those kind of things in there. This is just, it's got like the holding cube and then everything else. Right. So, I mean, it's... It's cool. Yeah. It's interesting. And you're getting a lot of stuff. It's just you'd have to break it down to see what the value really is. Yeah. I, I am not going to do the math right now for everybody, but... Uh-oh. Sounds like my niece is doing something bad in the background. Uh-oh. At least she waited till now until we didn't have a guest. A guest? <laughs> yes. Yes. The we were, but while, before you popped in, he did warn me. He could have had stream children, too. <laughs> um right yeah i think this like the the cube set I, I have to say like it's it's so very cool and i wanted to talk about it but it's the kind of thing that i'm like i don't think i would have the money for ever getting this thing like the unless i'm like trying to like get all the star trek stuff in one big go wow yeah 258 is a lot of money I, it is, but if you're if you're really in, into it and you hadn't gotten the chance to buy any of it yet, yeah, it has a lot of good stuff for it. You know, got like it. I do find it interesting that it's got what three dice sets. I guess it's supposed to be for like the three kind of classes in Star mm -hmm. Trek. You know, your science people, your command people, and your operations people. So 
that's cool, and it's got a lot of... It, it's got everything you would need to play, and more, seemingly. So, hey. And you get a cool board cube. And you get the cool board cube, too. Um, I do like I do like the like the galaxy map too kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, everything in it looks awesome. Yes, I agree. Everything looks quite cool. So, you know. Uh. Anyway, so I definitely would say check that one out. That one's a cool one. And if you have the extra money to spend on it, more power to you. Go ahead and go for it. Go for it. I give you the thumbs up over around here. Okay. Uh, previously, we had talked a little bit about the Corleus RPG uh, from Free League Publishing, and they've announced that they have a new book. A, uh, I believe it's a it's a adventure saga. So it's an epic space saga. So it's the first in the uh, Mercy of the Icon series, Emissary of the Lost. So. If you didn't know about Coriolis, it's Coriolis Third Horizons RPG. It's like I'll use the description that someone else gave, just because to keep it sub uh, simple, it's Arabian Nights in space. You know, so it's like a lot of it, it, it's tales, it's space, it's kind of space adventure fantasy. I'd say you know, so sci-fi adventure fantasy a little bit, kind of trying to grab the. Um, feeling of right um and uh this is the it's it's their campaign that they're basically pushing forward with this this is this is the first adventure in their full campaign um so it has like a lot of it, it's a big book too you know that's what i have to say it's it would be like a Curse of Strahd book or a, you know, um, Pathfinder Mega Dungeon book for those, because usually they have much smaller stuff. Or, like, if you've got the Rise of the Rune Lords, the complete book, you know, right. that's the kind of thing that this would be. It's it's a big old book of a gigantic adventure that you would take forever to run through, and it's only one part of a Mega Quest series. So, I, I guess more like the um, Dragon Queen arc that they did in D&D &D of a couple books together. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, the first part of the adventure takes the, uh, place on the huge space station Coriolis itself. So it's like the namesake of the uh, adventure. Um, and this is, you know, definitely a... It, there's a lot of fans to uh, Coriolis, apparently. You know, it's, 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 it's a popular one and, you know, it's got some, like, awards and stuff as a new one. Um, so there's definitely some people that really like it. And, um, the same people that did Mutant Year Zero and Tales from the Loop are also the ones that worked on this. So, uh, though I think those are, those might be published by, like, other companies, but the same people that developed it developed this one. So, right. Yep. Yeah. So if you are interested in Coriolis and you want to check it out for yourself, this big adventure here might be a way to get into it. You know, uh, for especially, as I say, adventures usually pertain better to newer newer DMs or DMs that just don't have a lot of time. Um, if you have time to make it a, a world for yourself, do it. If you don't, or you don't have enough skill, or you feel you don't have enough skill, do one of these adventures. You can you can you know tailor it to yourself, and it's fine. I always like it. I like pre-made adventures that way. God, you know, <laughs> what, I'm planning on starting up a couple more RPG shows on this channel, and I'm going to be doing some pre-made adventures because, with just a little tweaking, because heck, if I have time for all of them. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> What's time? Time. Cool. Hey, Courier's Quantumate qu Quidition. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> I, they do. <laughs> It's so silly because they just, it's Quarriers. Quarriers, which yeah. is like this. It's all the expansions. Yeah. It's uh, 340 custom dice, 211 cards, uh, spells, creatures, and quests, one double side glory tracker, four glory markers, four quest markers, four felt bags, and the rule book. And <sighs> a tree, a pear tree. 340 dice? That is a. 
And it's only $70. Yeah, that is a... I think that's a really good price, considering you're getting all the expansions, all the, you know... Well... All the car cards, all the dice. Mm -hmm. Well, the WizKids site puts it up for the MSRP of 100 so if you're getting it... If you found, if uh, you found a place for 70 I I found a place that said pre-order for sixty nine ninety nine. That's the thing is the MSRP is not necessarily the price that people have to sell it from. So yeah. that's that's the recommended price. Okay, so it's hundred dollars normally. Well, that's yes. still not well, too bad. The place that you saw where it might be just might be that they can get some of them from the company for cheaper for whatever reason, and so they can Maybe sell because them. Because they're something. buying in bulk. Yeah, they're buying in enough of bulk that they can sell them for seventy. And yeah, so it's the miniature marketplace. Yeah. Yeah, it's a special price sixty nine ninety nine, regular price ninety nine ninety nine, yeah. <laughs> God. Uh, so you can save twenty bucks, but you only get free shipping on over ninety nine dollars worth of purchase. Ah, uh, so see, that's that's one, you know <laughs> that's where they can get some extra money from you. Yeah. Shipping. Well all yeah, that they pro shipping of it could be close to twenty bucks. The thing is also it has all the promos. Uh, including the never foreseen Ghosts of Xmas past, present, and future. Yeah. I mean, even for $100, it's a deal. Yeah, there's so much in it, and Quarriers is like one of those games that we've played on uh, Sundays at Tabletop. Quarriers is fun. Quarriers uh, is a very fun game. Yeah, it's it's this weird combination of a deck builder, but it's really a dice bag builder, almost you could say. It's a deck builder, but with dice instead of cards. Yeah. It's exactly what it is. Um... And it's it's such a crazy little thing like that that it, it it works well and it's interesting and I'm glad to see that they've got such a crazy addition and if you don't have warriors and you want to get into it this might be the way to go because you have everything and sorry even a hundred dollars yeah even a hundred dollars for three hundred and forty dice is crazy. custom dice yeah not even just dice custom dice because each is their own yeah it's like. Like, normally, when you're getting, like, dice and stuff, you can never get them for that kind of price. So, yeah. granted, yes, you're probably not going to be using these dice in a lot of other places. But still. Well, no, but it, it's a fun, fun game. And to get everything, including, especially including the promos, that's awesome. Yeah. You don't it. see a lot of companies that do that. No, like, to add in the promos, uh, especially when you've got, like, a compilation like this. Like, that's one of those one things that I ha always had to complain about, uh, Carcassonne. Carcassonne I loved, but trying to get everything for Carcassonne was awful. There was a lot of promos and, like, little miniature sets that were very hard to find. And even if you could find them then, like, it, like, like, their compilations were, you never, they were random. They're, like, compilations were random. And I think they're a little better now. Because I think they changed companies that were like really putting them out, but still, like there was times there was like, okay, I want to have these expansions, but you can only find this one and this one, but this one has the other expansions too. So how can I like also get this one in Arg? Right. So it's great that they're putting it all together. I'm just saying. Yeah. So it's cool. Awesome. Warriors, Ultimate Quidition. <laughs> It's uh, it, it's coming soon. It's on pre-order. If you want to actually like look into getting it, so yes. Uh, and its rules are available for download if you want to read that one because. And watch our episodes that we played it. Yes, watch our episodes that we played it. Definitely, they're up on uh, YouTube. Hey, Star Wars: Allies and Adversaries. It's been announced. Um, if we had our show last week, I would have talked about this one. So I'm just gonna hit on this briefly. It's, it's made to be, like, look into the iconic characters. Um, it's going to have 130 NPCs from different factions and time periods from Star Wars. So if you are doing the Star Wars RPG by Fantasy Flight, this is actually something you might want to get, especially if you want to include some of the actual, like, Star Wars canon characters that exist out there. Because it's 130 NPCs. And that's villains and heroes. Yeah. And again, from different eras also helps too. So you could you yeah. could be if you're playing like, you know, back in the prequel trilogy days, guess what? You got your characters. If you're doing the like, you know, uh our core Star Wars, which is the better stuff one, the original uh trilogy, hey, we got you covered. <laughs> 
and it's right. made to work with uh, all the source books. So Edge of the Empire, Age of Rebellion, and Force and Destiny. They're definitely made to work with all of them. So you could have your Edge of the Empire, and all of a sudden, you know, something happens, and Darth Vader shows up, and you're probably screwed. But guess what? You know, you can have the stats for it and figure out what's going on. Or you can fight Boba Fett. Yeah. Before shoot he the missile, shoot the missile that's on his backpack. Ooh, backpack missiles. That's that's one thing I always thought was a big weakness of his. It's like you have a giant missiles, well not giant, but you have a large missile sitting on your back. <laughs> Could wouldn't someone just target that to blow you up? Yeah. <laughs> and isn't he technically a clone of a Mandalorian? So it's kind of weird too. Yeah, it's uh, it's he's strange. Yep. Mm -hmm. He also only has like what a couple lines in the whole trilogy. Yeah, and then he like has the stupidest out, but everybody like loves him for whatever reason. Yes, I, I I don't think he's a bad character. I'm not gonna argue against no, that. No, I'm not saying he's not that he is, but it was just such a weird like he's there and then he's gone kind of thing. Yes. So yeah, but um, the book is coming out, and um. This is one of those ones I would definitely recommend checking out if you do the Star Wars RPG. Because, like, there's a couple of books that, like, are an RPG series that I definitely would recommend getting a copy of whenever you're doing it. And this is one of those. Because it's... Not only is it characters from the Star Wars universe that would help you. It gives good examples of NPCs. And that's one of those things that I like an NPC book for. Because it gives you an idea of where to work from when building your own NPCs. You know, you, yeah. you get a better idea of building good NPCs from an NPC book. Even if you're not going to use them. It's a good thing to have, to give you a good I'd idea. Agree. So, but that is coming soon. It's They're being worked at over at Fantasy Flight, so we can expect it. Um, they're expecting it out um, uh, spring this year, so second quarter. Cool. So, Mo Diffie. Also, what we would have talked about last week, if we had to have to cancel the show, I had on the docket Conan the Brigand. A bunch of these are like from last week and a couple from this week. So if if yeah. if, if you've heard about this before out there in the uh, universe, hey, guess what? Uh, <laughs> we unfortunately just couldn't do last week, so here we are. But Conan the Brigand, the long line of Conan does a lot of jobs. <laughs> I mean, what is it, Conan? I really Conan gets fired a lot. I know. <laughs> well, when you're a barbarian, you know, it's hard for you to, like, land a solid job. So this is, like, about the Hyborian great deserts and being a nomad, all that kind of thing. And he about... really does get around a lot. He gets around a lot. He wanders around and does stupid stuff all the time. I, I think there's... I think he clothes himself. Yeah, like he was a thief before, but now he's a brigand. Mm -hmm. He's going to raid people. Nomads, raiders, brigands, it's... But isn't a barbarian basically the same thing? Sort of, yet not. <laughs> sort of, yet not. No, the only thing I have to say about all these books is they do introduce you to more of Hyboria. You know, the, it's a large, expansive world that... Um, God, I can't remember the name of the author who came up with the original Conan. Um, Robert Howard. Robert E. Howard. He came up with a heck of a world with a lot of details. And so when they're bringing us, like, introducing new kingdoms and regions and places, that's why a lot of these books are really good. Because if you want to, like, flesh out your Hyborian world, great. And, and they... To me, though, I think what might... I know Conan's the more well-known name than Hyborian, mm -hmm. but I think the system should should be Hyborian, and then you don't have to have, you know, like, this could be the Brigand campaign. Well, that's the thing is, it Instead is the... Conan the Brigand. Conan the... Thief. Conan the blah. Yeah. 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 I, I know do... it's a way of experiencing their world. It just sounds so weird when you're like... Look, he's had 150 jobs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the thing is, it, it, I'm not saying it's like not great stuff that they're adding into the world with this book. Which, yeah. if you look at what's in the book, it's great stuff that they're adding into the world of Conan 
in that book. And it's very nice and cool things. And if, depending on your campaign, you might want this. I will not argue that it's a good book, but it's just like when they, the way they frame it a little bit that, you know, like it's back about, you know, like that we're using the frame of Conan spending some time as a brigand in, I don't know what book, but probably one of them. There were a yeah. lot of Conan books though. Yeah. It just seems kind of funny when, you, when, when you're saying Conan the every time. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> Conan, the daddy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious about how many Robert E. Howard actually wrote. That that would be, like, the only thing I'd be curious about, like, how many Conan books he actually finished up. Because uh, there are a lot of Conan books that I'm sure he didn't write, now, at least more into nowadays. And the fact is, he, he died in 1936. So, right. yeah. Oh, but anyway, yeah. Uh, Conan books. They are, um, yep. But yeah, Brigand. Conan is a Brigand. It's out. If you are using the uh, I'm going to try to butcher these I'll pronounce the Turan uh, Zambula and Kuran uh, kingdoms or any of the territories around them hey this book will provide you with a lot of information about it and they do have some more creatures like the, the they're like um, what I forget what they, we, we talked about their um, monster book the other day and I'm forgetting it now or the other week because I am so so forgetful. Oh, he was a barbarian, mercenary, thief. I, if I can see these now. God. Um, probably some more in there. But, like... The nanny. The nanny. Conan the nanny. <laughs> oh, pirate. He was a pirate. Yes. Uh -huh. I think Conan the nanny would be interesting. But, no, just I'm just looking at the, you know, I know, books there that they had listed because reasons. Um... I'm, I'm looking oh, at... His, Horrors his... of Hyboria, H. Yeah, that's the book. That, there was the monster book. They got some in there, too. What were you looking at, though? Oh, the... I'm looking at his Wikipedia page to see if it says how many... Conan I, was look, I looked at it... I briefly looked through it, and I'm sure there's somewhere in there that you can find more about it. But it's kind of hard to suss out where his... what his work were. Yes. Writers I, seem to have a trouble like listing their actual books if not in their entries. And I have to complain about that on Wikipedia. Like at least like TV shows or filmographies show it much nicer. Just saying that. Just saying that. Anyway. Okay, let's see. Oh, I found a list. Hold on. 1 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. Uh, About 25, it looks like. Okay. Or maybe, oh, uh, God, no, some of these are by other authors, too. Damn it. Never mind. Oh, like uh, like Robert Jordan did a lot of books, yeah. too. So it seems like a little bunch of others. No, they have a, they have a billion Conan books, so it's like it's, yeah. and and a lot of them are uh, based on you know uh, Howard's original stuff, but still, yeah, it, it, it's hard. It's really not easy. We'd have to do decent research to figure out Everything. how many he actually wrote. Yeah. Um. Let's move on, though. Yes. Uh, Time Breaker was announced by Looney Labs. Looney Labs, the same company that has brought us Flux and other other interesting games, has Time Breakers, a new card game that they are talking about. Um, it's uh, you have strict rules about changing the past, of course, because you're a time traveler. Um, it's a chase across time to catch the Chron Crim Chrono Criminal. Basically, so you're going after Chrono Criminals, um, and um, 
you jump from one tile to another in like a tile based game and each one represents a different year and it's made to be a fast paced card game where you navigate the time stream to try to arrest the time breaker and then re repair time basically so pretty simple well, yeah there. you have to return them the time repair hq before your opponents catch up or the breaker slips away yes two to five players um to be 10 to 40 minutes so it's actually got a pretty like good it, it, it i i feel like it would probably it's supposed to be probably like a little bit like flux how like flux can be very short or it can be very long you know and I'm guessing since, you know, you're kind of like racing against each other, depending on the situation, you might interfere with each other and therefore make it that, you know, the time breaker is harder for them to catch it. Stuff yeah, like that. It looks like it comes out the very last day of February. Yeah. So, time breaker, February 28th. Oh, yeah, you're right. Last day. Dang. Cool. Looney Labs does great stuff, so I wanted to kind of give them a shout out. Yes, I agree. Last one. Last main topic. Victorian Masterminds. This looks freaking awesome. I love the art for this. Which I'm, I don't have a good picture to show po folks, unfortunately. Um, if, if you go to their website... I can... You, well, that picture... I can't, I can't frame it with that by itself. Oh, the ah. picture of the box? Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I can look up the, probably the box and stuff and find that. Uh... Um, for going masterminds. Yeah, if I get a picture. Oh, there's a picture of the box. Yes. Yeah. I love the guy's beard stash. Yeah, he does have an epic beard stash. I I highly agree. The epic beard stash is definitely a need be when you're an evil Victorian guy. Because um, also the one guy looks kind of like the Undivider. Yes. <laughs> no, I actually see that. Strangely enough, that 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 can be very easily seen. Uh, I wouldn't have even thought of it, but when you say it now, I can't see unsee things. <laughs> ha 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 ha. Um, so, Victorian Masterminds is all about, well, crime and being a mastermind in Victoria and England and such. Ooh, you can download the rule book. <laughs> so you take the role of villains, the final stage of a grand scheme to take over the world. Uh, you could have monstro you you have your mechanical monstrosities finished. All they left to do is the last few parts, fire it up, and take on the road. Um, but you can't do it on your own. You have to then send various agents across the world to major cities, each with their own special abilities. You gain resources, steal buildings, kidnap scientists, sabotage each other's plans, because only one person can rule the world. Yes, yeah, so you can go to places like Washington, Rome, and Paris. Yes. Um... Yeah, and so Sherlock Holmes is missing, and the supervillains are basically... Because it's Victorian, so of course it's that day I like mentioned Sherlock Holmes. So it's like, you know, you're picking the role of something like Moriarty and something like, Oh, Sherlock's missing! I can take over the world! <laughs> hey, hey, first game of the year mentioning Sherlock! At least he's not mentioned and not focused on it. Yes, I'll, I know. I'll, I'll, I'll give it that. Um... So yeah, so it's it's a really interesting little looking game, and um, Come On Games has uh, officially announced it now. I think it's coming out twenty fifth. So actually this week. Oh nice. So yeah, I probably could have pushed this to talk about it next week. Technically, the minis look really cool too. Oh yeah, like you, you like where you can actually have like the little buildings of like world the monuments Eiffel you Tower, can steal. Big yeah. Ben. It's like I'm stealing the Eiffel Tower. I'm stealing the Colosseum. Yeah. Do, do you have a shrink ray to do that, or are you just stealing the entire thing? Because if I have a shrink ray to do it, it that's, you know. I'm just picking it up and walking away with it. Well, I have mechanical monstrosities, so they probably are steam-powered and take it away for me. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's still kind of funny of, I'm stealing the Colosseum. Yeah, well, I, stealing I, the I, Eiffel I Tower or Big Ben? I never understood how stealing monuments equals ruling the world. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Hey, your monuments. You will surrender, or I will not return your monuments to you. Oh no! Okay. <laughs> well, that sucks. But we're we're, we're going to just continue being a country and not bow down to your will. <laughs> <laughs> I I think I think it's more like 
if I can do this, I can do far worse kind of thing. Right, maybe I, I get it. Be. It's just yeah. kind of, I always found it a bit, a bit of lunacy. Yeah, I agree. I've stolen all the world's monuments, mwahaha, and stuck them on the moon. Yeah. And it looks like you do you do have to deal with uh, a secret service where they are kind of like trying to capture you. Well, they call it a secret service, but I assume it's like a, you know, secret agent kind of group. Oh, you can steal the White House. <laughs> um... Now, is the president still in it? Sure. You can kidnapped the president. Might, that might be a good reason why they might, uh... Capitulate. Victorian ninjas have kidnapped the president! Are you a bad enough dude, bad enough dude to rescue him? Mo-ho! Victorian ninjas have kidnapped the president! Mo-ho! Mechanical Victorian ninjas. Oh, yeah! Mechanical Victorian ninjas! Uh... Are you, a ba- are you a bad enough secret service agent in order to rescue him? Me! <laughs> bad dudes. Victorian age version. I, I, I totally want to know more about the guy with the octopus on his turban. I mean... <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, they're all, like, really interesting villain-looking like looking, uh, oh, yeah. groups. Yeah, so I think it's... I think it's going to be a very cool game. Come on, does a lot of cool stuff, so that's a very interesting one to see. And it's coming out this week, the 25th. And also, so, the woman seems to have mechanical spiders of some sort. She does. The one with the goggles on her hat. Yes. Because uh-huh. hat goggles is a great combination. The, the other woman has, like, goggles around her around neck. Around her neck, yeah. And then, uh, yeah. And he, they're, they're, this is the only goggle. Well, no, I guess the underminer dude kind of has a pair of interesting goggles too yeah because you got like the shades you can put over it and, yes. and then of course you got the spectacles on our like main dude the old man with the octopus who's got who looks like he's got like an octopus on his back <laughs> you see the tentacles and then like the viking looking guy yeah i don't know what's his story and then you had the guy who looks kind of like vlad the impaler yep <laughs> who's no like no the, the guy the guy in the front reminds me of like the what year was it? The, the Dracula movie. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, Dracula is Vlad the Impaler. That's true. That's true. <laughs> but when you say Vlad, you think of traditional Vlad, okay, not fine. like you know Dracula. He, he, yes, he makes me think of the Dracula for the movie too, because of the glasses. Yeah, and the hat, the red and stuff tinted. Too. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Although Dracula didn't have an epic beard stash. No, he didn't have an epic beard stash. And this guy does. He does. All right. Let's move on, though. We have Deeper Discussion, which we have two games that we can handle on from two weeks of gameplay playing. Wow. Um, We played uh, Pocket Pitch Putt and Beneath Nexus, which I forgot to bring those games up to show them off. But I can quickly show images here. Oh, Pocket Pitch Golf showed up. Eh, We'll switch over nicely. Sort of. It's good enough. I'm not going to frame them better. It took a lot longer than we thought. Pocket Pitch Buff, I think, takes a long time. I think it's the only thing about it. And I... I think It's also of, a weird number of players. I have to say, I think out of all the three of them, Pocket Pitch Golf, it's interesting, but it's my least favorite. I like the other two of the Stocking Stuffer collection. But this one is a very different game, and I feel like if, if I was more of a golf fan... Maybe I would like it more, but like, it's not bad. It's just it takes a lot longer than you think for such a small game. The yes. other ones were really small and quick. Yeah, and this one's small, but it takes a long time. We played what at least an hour. I think they said twenty five. They say twenty five minutes per game, but I think it's much more than. I guess if you get it down pat, maybe. Like, yeah, we were still referencing rules and stuff. Because there's little... We, yeah, there's we like, only did nine holes in about an hour. Yeah. I mean, if, if a standard game is nine holes, let's say like that, because then maybe I could see getting it down to 25 if we were very efficient, even at two to three players. But 25, I think, is still like perfect game. Generous, yeah. Yeah. Not impossible, but perfect. And that's, again, nine holes. If you're doing 18 holes, double that. So it's a much longer game, definitely. It's not a bad game. Yeah, the mechanics are work well. You know, that you try to hit to some place. 
but definitely I feel like there's a weird balancing act that we had to get hold of. Like, also, uh, the only other problem is the balls that come with it. Oh, they they are awful. We use something else for it. They, they, they yeah, we ended up using pieces of another game to represent balls because they're just small little discs of paper. Yeah, that are very hard to manipulate. And especially we, when you have hands like these. Yeah, I do have to say, like. Eh. The ball representation is much smaller than... It, it works for the game, but it's hard to manipulate. It works for being a small, cheap game. I but... would call it cheap. No, Cost-effective. Well, not... Cost-effective. Cost-effective. Yeah, that's what I meant. Uh, yeah. I, I don't mean cheap as in, like... Yeah. That, but small, cost-effective game, and be able to carry it around, you know, in a pocket. I understand why the pieces are so small and everything. It's just... It makes playing it very hard. No, and I think the basic mechanics of that, the the nine cards you play with are flipped over and then become, the, uh, or one side of, uh, there's 18 cards, each card has holes on them, and you arrange the holes, nine holes at a time, so the other half of the cards then become uh, the cards you're playing with, which are affecting yeah. the ball strikes. I think that that was done very well. No, I, I will definitely say the game is designed. And... The game is mostly designed well. I think like the balls are the only thing I have to complain about. That like, because of the nature of it, you can't have like really large pieces. Like the little like cardboard things that they had with them were appropriate, but you really need different game pieces. I, I think if they would have made even small wooden discs that were a little thicker, it would have yeah. made it easier. And they, that still could have been put in a pouch. Yeah, you could maybe fit, fit like a couple of those in there, probably. But no. it would cost more money for them to make, though, using wood or something. And again, it's a... It's a cost-effective game. It, it's, yeah, made to be very simple. It's meant to be a stocking stuffer. Something small, yeah. quick, easy. And small, easy, at least. This one is definitely not the quick one out of it. But it's... Yeah. If you like golf, it's an interesting little golf game. Definitely. Um, so I put this out of like a... I want to put it at a full recommendation for it. I would say Pocket Pitch Golf Putt is a little bit of... It's a little more acquired taste than the others. I think if you're a fan of golf, you might really enjoy it. Otherwise, the other two you might want to stick to. Yeah. And again, it's not a bad game as someone that's played it. We can't say it's a terrible game. It plays well. It's well designed. It's, it's at least interesting. But yeah. I definitely feel like you need that like like a connection to golf is better uh, if you like golf games in general. Like, even if you like golf video games, you might like this one, too. Um, because it has some very interesting dynamics with the cards. Um, that you're always getting affected by two cards and a card of your own. And depending on how you struck the ball, depends on how many of these cards you can ignore. Um, it, that it makes the rounds interesting. Definitely. And yeah. it's a balancing act of, like, if you want to hit farther, you can get rid of less cards. If you want to hit shorter, you can't get rid of Right, but the problem is it's, it's balancing act. If you want to hit farther, more cards of your opponents are going to affect you. Oh yeah, yeah, which can be a problem. No, yep, yeah, definitely. But you definitely have to hit further at times. I learned because I tried to play it middle middle of the road, and it did not work so well. No, I I went for I, I basically like yoloed it a lot of times, and I was just like, nope, you gotta throw it forward for sometimes, just sometimes. Um. But uh, now that we've reviewed it, the Stalker Stuffer Collection is good. I would say definitely would recommend getting the Stalker Stuffer Collection because you get them all together technically. Um, the collection of games is wonderful. Well, I thought I thought with the Stalking Stuffer Collection you could actually pick and choose if you wanted multiple copies of one or... Maybe on the Kickstarter, I think. Because oh, okay. they've finished their Kickstarter and they have it on sale now. Um... I remember you mentioning something about it. it. Might have been Kickstarter only then. You can get each of them individually now. You okay. get each of them for six dollars, or the entire thing for sixteen. Um, so you save three dollars, one dollar in each of them for getting all of them. Um, so like, if you if you're planning on getting them all together, I I would say it's fine. It's a fine collection. Um, the 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 pocket pitch putt, putt is worth it for you know getting the entire collection together. I I would say that at least you know. The, the extra, like, four bucks you would get. Well, no, actually, um. Three bucks, because you're saving three dollars. Oh, you're saving, wait. No, you're saving, I'm sorry, 
So two dollars. <laughs> okay, so yeah, the extra four bucks then. The extra four bucks for it is not bad for four bucks. I'm gonna say that definitely. It's yeah. it's it's worth it for that one. Um, though I lost all my ball tokens, but two of them because they're you watch it. It's easier to vote. But I balls can explode. Well, I I like throwing that thing into my pocket a couple of times and like in weird places in order to carry it yeah. around. So like if, if if you if you're just careful, a little more careful with it and watch where the ball tokens are, you won't lose them. I lost them because I'm stupid and only had or the put two them in anyway. A baggie. Yeah, something that you can keep them a little easier. Um, so. Yep. Pocket pitch ball, but um, definitely say it's an interesting one. Um, if you're getting the entire collection, I, I I would say it's fine to get with it. I would recommend getting the entire collection, but if you just want to get one or the other of the other two, I would recommend them higher than this one. I like those better. Not that this was not a bad one, but it's an interesting collection. Yeah. All right. And then the other one for our deeper discussion is, of course, Beneath Nexus. Now, this is an interesting one. Um, I don't think we had necessarily a bad time, but there were certain things about it that I definitely think um, maybe our playthrough of it wasn't great. Because I think it's a three to six player game where one person takes on everybody else. Um, I played as the role of a, a uh, overlord that was sending monsters and stuff against players and <clears throat> strategizing in order to defeat them and everybody else is the players. I what? liked it. It's just we ended up just pa ha by happenstance getting a really bad room on our first round combined with monsters that really worked well with that room. And it puts and you it at a was... big disadvantage very quickly. Right. That first round put us at a huge disadvantage. We all lost a decent amount of life in that first round and couldn't heal. No. It, that was preventing you from that. That's what that's what made it such a grud such a yeah hard match against you was it, I, I can't... we got screwed early yeah and that's the thing is I feel like any game can have a combination that you kind of get screwed early on with it can happen um it's not an impossibility Unf and also you you played it very very smart yes by damaging all of us, but not killing. I left you guys all weakened for the final battle against me personally. Yeah, and we, and we didn't die because when you die, if at least one person makes it through the round, you come back at half. You come back at six life, which is half health. Instead, yeah. I left them below all six, which made it very easy to finish them off. Yeah, so it was just. It, it, we got in a bad situation the first round. I definitely would try the game again. I think it's very interesting mechanics. Oh yeah, no. And it was a lot of fun. It was just you. You were you were also. Hit... We didn't know our character. You know, since it's the first time playing, we didn't know the characters at all. Like I didn't realize my deck was only damage. It had no rebuffs. Yeah. Ability. And, 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 and I'm like, and, oh. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just that no. you have to be like. You have to be in the mindset of, like, I'm going to be just throwing a lot of damaging things out there. It's really good for me to, like, do a lot of these things. You know, my... my... Right, I was holding off trying to say, okay, where am I getting a rebuff? Because it looks like everyone else had rebuffs. And I'm like, oh. And at the end of the game, I look through the rest of the deck, I'm like, I don't have any. Yeah. I don't have any counter ability. So getting an idea that there's a difference between the counter abilities, the main abilities, and things like that. And on my side, you know, like, figuring out when to use all these different spells and things like that. It's a lot of m m management that way. And, and I think, like, I, there was a lot of good combinations that really helped me out on my side as the Blight Lord. And got us in a, and got the the my enemies the other people in a position that I was able to defeat them very easily and I was able to set that up and I think that's another thing is there's a heavy strategy element on the enemy side because if you're not careful you can get overwhelmed but the thing is because the number of monsters is usually based on the number of players it also does mean that there there isn't a lot of bonuses on the player's side if there's a lot of them. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Also, the problem with being the damage dealer is your abilities only go off when you kill things. So if yep. people didn't set it up for you on your turn to be able to kill something, 
You went first too. No, I was last. Oh, you were last. That's right. They were last. I was they... the slowest. Oh, that's right. You were the slowest. But they didn't know to set me up. But I didn't want. I didn't want to give out what my main thing was. Yeah, so you yeah. didn't have strategy against me, and it was kind of like a double-edged sword there. Yeah, and that's the thing is, yeah. Like I kind of tried to hint at it a couple times, like, "Hey guys, damage that one." Yeah. And so uh, they took it out, and I'm like, "God damn it! Don't take it out." <laughs> no, you know, um, it's an interesting game. Uh, I think it's a pretty good game. Um, I I definitely would give it a big passing grade. I don't think, I think because we ran into that error, that that like that problem that definitely set it up that it was less balanced in a way. I think there, it makes me worry that there's a little bit more like combinations could lead in very bad directions very early on. And I think that's the problem is you were put in a position that it may not have been impossible to recover from, but it was very, very difficult. It's part of, it's part luck and it's part strategy. Yes. And unfortunately... Uh, luck was not on our side. No. With the, 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 we had a 50-50 you know, pick on dungeons to start in. Yeah. And they were both you know face down. We picked the worst one. Actually, the other I, one actually wouldn't have been so bad. I think the first time you picked the worst one, the second time you picked the better one of yes, the two dungeons. But the problem was that first one was really bad and <laughs> effective with the monsters that you had in your hand. Yeah. Definitely. With what I had uh, out in play, it worked very well. Um, I, I, give a, I give it kind of like a passing grade, I'd say. like not, not, It's not a perfect game. Definitely not with like the problems that we saw. But it's a, it's a pretty good game, and it definitely was fun to play. Um, yeah. I mean, one thing I could have done differently was I had the option to actually kill myself. Yeah. And I should have. You actually should have. <laughs> yep. Oh, because no, I... that might have been able to turn the tide at the end. Having might having a little extra hit points would have definitely helped you a lot. Oh, I, I think I was down to like two hit points, and instead so having six, I would have had six. That I might have been able to actually defeat you because I was I had a lot of large damage cards in my hand, and if yeah. I could kill off an aspect, I get a bonus. Yes. So I was the right person at the end to be there, just in the wrong amount of health. <laughs> yep. Because I think every, everyone else had, like, one, and I was able to finish them off, like, whoop, gone. Yeah. yeah. I think I, th I think it would have taken me, like, two turns to kill all of you, basically. What we Like, the first turn I killed, like, one of you, and the second turn I could have killed the the, uh, the other two of you. I left you each. I no, think I... one person was already dead dead, I think. No, because... Oh, no, you're right, no. Because it was three of you versus me. You're right, and... you're right. Mm -hmm. You killed someone off right away. You killed the other person off the next round, and you were able to counter. I think what I did to and kill me. Yeah, it was it was so low at that point in time. Though. Yeah. So yeah. Um, but beneath Nexus, it's an interesting game. That's got a cool setup. Um, it, it, I definitely would say check it out for yourself, especially if you like the. Um, what kind of game would this be described as? The like the Overlord type games where it's one yeah. versus everyone else. Um, yeah. Yeah. Overlord card game. Yeah, the semi-cooperative, I call it, because you have one side cooperation and the other one against one bigger one. You know, it's the... It's, yeah. It's the, it's the traitor mechanic from uh, uh, Betrayal, but you're a traitor to begin with. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Beneath Nexus. Yeah, uh, go ahead and check that one out. I would definitely recommend seeing how you out there in the world like it yourselves. Um, let's let's skip Kickstarters this week. I was going to talk That's about a Kickstarter, but we're fine because we are really cutting it close on time. Um, our week at tabletop. Um, I'll go. Why don't you? What what do we do on Sundays at tabletop? We'll hit that quickly. Um, oh Jesus. Um, last week we played. God. <laughs> um. Well, we did frag one of the weeks, didn't we? Yeah, we did frag one week. That was two weeks ago. We did frag Gold Edition. Yep. Which we tried a handmade map, which was a little difficult to read. It wasn't the and worst map. Kicked butt. Yeah. Because 
two people decide to beam into the area that I was in, and then Blaze was able to come in and kill all of us, basically. Yeah, no, he the the, the setup was, I no, you went in to kill someone went in to kill Blaze. I think it was, wasn't it? No, me. They oh. originally came to me because I was off in my own little room trying to gain stuff, and someone teleported into my room. And yes. I was able to. I used my spe I used my frag card to stop them from killing me. Mm -hmm. Then someone else beamed into that room. Yep. To try to kill both of us, managed to kill one, and um, I stopped the other. And then Blaze came in, I'm just <laughs> killed one person. You stopped him from killing me. But he he was able to just strip and then I th I think no off. and and then someone came in to like try to finish him off and then they he finished them off or them th off, there was yeah. a lot of cleanup there was a lot of cleanup in that room and it he yeah. got two kills very quickly everyone r ran into the same room except you I was on the other side like, yeah and I'm like why is everyone coming to my room yep so it was an interesting game and then oh, infighting was the other one we had oh yes we did mm -hmm. infighting which who won that. I don't think I did. I can't remember who won it off the top of my head. Um, I know I, was I didn't. I well for a while, and yeah. then I, I oh. did not win. I did awesome because I had zits out, and then unfortunately, I wasn't able to fully capitalize on his ridiculous like ability. Oh, God. It's, it zits is, is so almost broken. He's... He's... He, he If you get lucky, he can be broken is the thing. But it's a very heavy luck roll for his entire thing. Yes, it's just, if you can kill one thing, you can cut, then possibly kill another, and then another, and then another. He's the only character that can keep attacking like that. So he can chain attacks a lot, yeah. yes. But he has, but he is the highest number you have to roll, like, to get the high, which I think is what yes. you need. So he is very difficult, it's like, in comparison to everyone else, it's difficult for him to get high. And you know, and his, his damage, 13, yeah. yeah, and his damage output wasn't insanely high for all those attacks. It's just that he could chain them. Yeah. So, but the thing is, you can easily, if you roll decently and have enough dice showing, because dice showing gets added to your how how much yeah. to match your attack, you could kill off at least a lot of um, bystanders. Oh yeah, no. And you get a lot of points quickly and then maybe even think about trying to hit someone and get the win. Uh, yeah. So, it was interesting. It was a fun game. Uh, you know, I, I I was happy to get a little bit of Irate Extravaganza even though I didn't win. That was fine enough for me. Um, yeah. As for RPGs, I've had... Did I have only one session of each? Because I had a session of Madness of the Land, but not this week, last week, uh, in which they... Um, did some crazy stuff. Uh, they found this kind of, like, Beastmaster's stable run by Cyclops and somehow convinced him that they were not threats and that they were technically, like, peaceful travelers and uh, arranged to get, like, a dinosaur from him, which is very hard to get for him. And then ended up at a uh, lighthouse. And in uh, Legacies of Cain, they actually got out... They actually finished their side mission for once. Uh, they stole the staff, they got out, they didn't die. Great. They almost did. Any crazy badgers? Not this time, but crazy crap still happened. Uh, because unfortunately Samuel, who's the character, was not technically there, so we had him uh, sort of off on the side, because they're, the people that were with Samuel had pretty much accomplished their mission, so Samuel got the getaway. Well, Dawn, the other character there, had to climb into a sewer... And then got into a fight with, an, with a giant crocodile. Because um, they were fighting Tremere, and one of them used the uh, I can summon a creature by using ten blood points. So he summoned some kind of beast in the sewers, a giant crocodile to hunt down Dawn. So she got into like a fist fight with it, and then tossed an incendiary grenade down its mouth. <laughs> and uh, managed to live through the explosion... Uh, covered in, like, sewage water and, like, you know, stuff, because it was, like, a, during a rainstorm, too, so it was, like, flooding with, like, sewage water and all that over her, so it was, like, awful. But, and, like, she collapsed part of the tunnel. But it was awesome that she got in a fight with a crocodile. 
Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> oh no. The session went well for them. So. Ah, uh, and I think that's it. Hey! Consult the table. If you have any questions to ask us, you can ask us. Uh, there was a question earlier in chat that is that fits the agenda. Um, what's the difference between HDMI and DisplayPort? <laughs> you got that one? Um, well, HDMI can carry carry sound and video. Ah. Where DisplayPort only carries video, I believe. Bam! I would. I didn't know that difference. <laughs> Also, I think HDMI still has a higher... Um, has better resolution. Video, better resolution than yep. um, DisplayPort does. Cool. Um, awesome. There you go. Question <laughs> answered. If you have any questions like that, or actual tabletop-related questions, we'd be willing to answer them here on the channel. You can also check us out at uh, DiscussingTabletop at Yahoo.com, which is a good way of sending it, and my Discord, either of our Twitters, or in the comments of this one. It's up on YouTube. Uh, but... Uh, I am going to throw the Kickstarter up. I was going to support link up in the description. Just about that. That's all I'm going to do because I did find one earlier. There it is. It's a role-playing game. Fancy-based. Cool. Oh, I'm sorry. I do need to retro that. Um, DisplayPort can carry audio as well. Okay. But it's, like, not as good. Yeah. It, it, it's it's lower resolution than HDMI. HDMI is going to give you a higher quality. There you go. So, thank you everyone that's out there. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, uh, Joe, once again for popping in here. And, of course, uh, thanks to Alex Flagg, who joined us for the first hour of the show. <laughs> that was an epic interview, and I was very happy about it. It was great, great to have him on. So, Alex... Um, if you uh, end up watching the show again and coming back to here, love to have you on again sometime. Talk more about things. Uh, as for us, we'll be back tomorrow night for Sundays at the Tabletop. Uh, we'll also be back next week for our 101st episode. Um, you can find Joe at... Uh, his link will be in the description of the YouTube channel for his Twitter. You can find me here pretty much daily. You can find all my links in the description below. You can support us by, of course... Uh, subscribing on YouTube, following on Twitch, and or subscribing on Twitch if you have some uh, Twitch Prime or some money to spend. Or you can always check out the Patreon, which has some great rewards there. It will be updated a little bit more soon. The rewards are still pretty good, even though I am planning on updating them with a little better rewards. So keep an eye on, on that. You can get them now, and if the updates come to a level you're already at, hey, you already get it. Bonuses. And we will be back next week, but the following Saturday... We will be off before my birthday. Yes. Uh, that's the plan for your birthday. Um, as far as I know, nothing will come up that will draw me back into it. Like, if a really good guest would show up, I might do it on my own. But I haven't heard from anybody like that. You know. So. Anyway. Thanks for joining us. See you, folks. Bye.